Today's uh, next presentation is being presented by Fawn Amber Montoya. Um, she is Associate Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and External Engagement for the James Madison University Honors College. She teaches courses in race, ethnicity, and gender with a special focus on Mexican American history. Dr. Montoya is the co-author of Practicing Oral History to Connect University to Community and editor of Making an American Workforce, the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company's construction of a workforce during the Rockefeller years. Please put your hands together as we welcome uh, Dr. Fawn Amber Montoya. Wow, what an amazing group. There is a little bit of a downside to going last. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about something a little bit different. I'm going to talk about a journey that I'm on as an administrator. Um, I was not an honor student as an undergrad. Um, I went to a university that only accepted um, scholarship students. I was first generation. I was Pell eligible. Um, and of course, I am a minority. Um, I was a transfer student to that university, and my um, high school GPA was a 3.7 and a 28 on my ACT, so I did not technically qualify. I also did not have parents that understood the game of college admissions. So what I want to talk to you about today is what probably would have been my honors thesis if I had a chance to have done an honors thesis. And it really is a story um, about my ancestry. And it's a story about a very special place in southern Colorado um, that is um, tied to my family legacy that existed there from at least the 1880s. Um, what you see here is the mountains. They are called the Oaxacoyas. They're also known as the Spanish Peaks or the Breasts of the Earth. I remember going here in the 1980s to visit my great uncles. My family was picking up compost um, products for, or manure for compost products um, for our farm that we were living on at the time. And I remember it being a beautiful, vibrant green. And I remember the mountains um, and thinking about this as an origin location or an origin story, both for my family. Um, I visited um, in the 1990s. Um, I had been a student of history, and I was told I could research anything that I wanted to. And so naturally, I picked my own family story because I was intrigued by the mining community that was attached to this location. Here is an Orno. This is an adobe brick oven. And the adobe brick oven sits about 10 feet from my great uncle's home and from where my grandmother had, uh, my great great grandmother had settled um, in this region. So I had had all the op optimism of I'm going to go and I'm going to do these amazing phenomenal oral histories and all of these documents are going to exist and I'm going to make the most amazing paper and I'm going to put my career and my work um, founded in this region. Um, what I found was that the documents did not exist. Um, it was mostly um, illiterate individuals, people who were Spanish speakers, um, working class populations. And so those voices didn't fit into the dialogue of history at that time. So I have spent the past 20 years being a historian and moving around this phenomenal story. And so what has happened to me um, in this journey is that this space exists outside of this coal mining community. And for me, as a historian, I had never really thought too much in depth about the landscape itself. How would the land tell the story if the land had a voice? So as I was there about five years ago, this place continued to stand out to me. And then it hit me what this place actually was. Does anyone know? It was a baseball field. At the edge of it, you can almost imagine the pitcher's mound, home plate, first base, and stand along the sidelines. Sometimes when I think about that place, I think about the excitement of a night game. I think about how I used to play baseball as a child how I used to actually go to baseball games, which I haven't been in a very long time now. But what I also realized coming back after 20 years 
is that the field stood out to me for another reason. That in my academic career as a historian, I had actually done research on baseball. I had looked at coal mining communities. I had written at least two different book chapters about the importance of baseball in the lives of a coal mining community. So my historian's mind knew that baseball had unified the mining camps across land and nationality. I knew what it meant to the coal miners and to their families, and I knew what it meant to their definitions of Americanness. So why this story? I think for me it's about honors as an interdisciplinary space. It's about what honors means to me as being in this space where my students don't necessarily know how to find themselves. I think it's really kind of breaking down and tearing down the limits of our own disciplines. It's thinking about our academic homes. It's thinking about where our training might be. And it's thinking about what we envision ourselves in doing in our work as being administrators. If your journey is anything like mine, you probably thrive in interdisciplinary spaces. But that might not have been your academic home. So what I'm thinking about now is as administrators, as faculty members, and advocates of honors, how do we define our students, our faculty, and our own disciplinary realities? Is honors a space for students with just high GPAs and test scores? Or is it a space for students who are willing to look beyond their own disciplines to see a new reality? Are we open to them redefining their disciplinary training? Do we encourage it? Do we bend to it? Are we willing to fight other departments or colleges who are just focused on graduate programs or on careers and being willing to think about breaking down these molds? How do we define our disciplinary spaces of our own faculty and colleagues? Are we really open to thinking about cutting across disciplines? Do we seek these spaces out? Are we willing to take chances on junior faculty, on ABDs that might have an inter interdisciplinary lens but an untried pedagogy? Are we willing to shift our own research, training, and publications to design new models of scholarship that might not answer to university presses or push the limits of peer review? So if we are willing to do this, how do we do this? And so I have three suggestions, and I'll give you some specific examples. So the first one is, is that we need to come back to the origin of why are we in honors? What is honors for us? For me, honors really is about the interdisciplinary spaces. It's about the limits of my own discipline of history. What story can I not tell because the documents or the methodology doesn't fit with the people behind the story? So are we making spaces or creating spaces for students to feel brave in their work? Are we actually modeling interdisciplinary practices and courses and our scholarship? And do we share with our students the work that we're doing? This is Alyssa Vargas Lopez. I met Alyssa when she transferred to Colorado State University Pueblo from, a junior, from an undergrad uh, community college. She was a junior majoring in sociology. She decided to join honors because she had heard of me, so it was a reference, but she didn't really know what honors was. And over the next two to three years, we talked about what she actually wanted to do in the long term. And she said, I want to work in a museum. But we were a small institution, and we didn't have a museum studies program. We didn't have a public history program. And so I worked with her over two years to start defining a space for herself. And so what we did for her honors projects is she worked with um, what was called the Pueblo um, Army Depot. It's also known as the Pueblo Chemical Depot. But she put together a museum exhibit also partnering with the local um, public library. So Alyssa was able to create a space for herself within honors in which she envisioned herself both as a public historian and then also as an individual in museum studies. Um, Alyssa right now is finishing up an internship with um, the um, Smithsonian. Uh, this is actually her second internship with the Smithsonian. She now has a master's um, in public history. Um, and she's been a phenomenal experience for me because I was able to be part of this amazing journey. I think one of the best parts about her exhibit work is during her research she actually uncovered family members that had worked at the Pueblo Chemical Depot that she had not known about. This is the other example that I want to talk about. Um, interdisciplinary practices. This is my amazing colleague, colleague Brianna Gaines. 
Brianna Gaines is an ABD candidate or a PhD candidate at James Madison University in the College of Health and Behavioral Sciences. Um, Brianna's work looks specifically at post-traumatic stress disorder as it relates to the experience of slavery. I met Brianna when we, she and I were both um, DEI coordinators for our respective colleges. And I was fascinated by the amazing work that she was doing. And I approached her and I said, well, why don't you think about teaching an honors course? But she'd never taught a college course before. She was just barely finishing up her PhD exams and didn't feel like she was qualified to teach. I had the opportunity to visit Brianna's class um, about a month ago. Phenomenal. Everything was textbook about what she should be doing. Lectures, YouTube videos, quotes for students, combining history, African American studies, and psychology all in one space. And this is just a little bit of the description of the course that she's teaching. Unsolicited comments that I've received from students about Brianna's class include, it means something that a black woman is teaching a course on her research about black women. As a black woman to be in a course with another black woman teaching and someone who's working on her PhD means that I can do this. And so I think for me, Brianna's experience is also very much about her vulnerability and being willing to share and to share often about her own work. I also, have an, as an administrator, have to sometimes pause and think about the work that I'm doing. And over the past six months, I've returned to that initial story of thinking about the ghosts of my past. But I've also had to open up some of my own research and scholarship to students' experiences or to student opportunities. This past week, I was invited to present um, in a class about a chapter that I wrote almost five years ago called Reconciling Personal and Professional Goals. Students on my predominantly white campus realized that they did not have a lot of examples of Latinx or Latina experiences in the classroom. And so I naturally am the experience. Unfortunately, my expertise is actually in Southern Colorado history and looking at coal mining communities. So I pulled together a chapter that I had written for a book that my sister-in-law had written about, um, it's called Silencing Gender, Age, Ethnicity, and Cultural Biases in Leadership. When I gave a copy of the chapter to the professor who had invited me to come to the course, I was reminded that, oh, this was written sort of last minute. There are some clear errors in the grammar. Uh, there are some very uncomfortable things talking about my motherhood, talking about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a Latina, what it means to no longer be religious, and also what my perspective is in regarding to my own scholarship. So this past week, I had the opportunity to visit that class. <laughs> And it was terrifying because I'd put myself out there in a way that I questioned whether or not my students would take me seriously. Students that only knew me by a title and students had never really thought about what it might mean for me to be a Latina, what it might have been to be a person of faith, or what it actually feels and looks like to be a professor. So these creation of interdisciplinary spaces is not easy for us. It takes bravery, allies, personal philosophical shifts about our own work, being willing to step out of our own disciplines and out of our own training, being willing to put ourselves out there and talk about the realities of what it means to be professors, administrators, scholars, and also people. So I wanna share with you this final image. This was a Google Maps that I screenshotted on Monday. Do you see the outline? This is the field that I had shown you at the beginning. This is the field that came up again and again in my research of a baseball field. For me, the coal miners were actually here. They played here. You can still see the baseball field outlined on a Google map taking almost 100 years later. And this is where it's a little bit interesting. So for me, the field and the men that play in it are real to me. Not because I've played or even seen baseball played, but because I'd studied these men, these times, and specifically how the game of baseball connected the men to each other, how they allowed it to, identify, to define themselves. But for me, what I realized is that in all of my work, I had sought to understand their pasts, and I didn't always see them 
from the lens of history, that I needed to think about them in the current time and think about this space in current time. So it's not the past that I want to see, it's really the present. And I want to believe that somehow they continue to live on in this space. Otherwise, why would it still exist? This field speaks to me in the same way that I imagine it spoke to Ray Kinsella in the novel Shoeless Joe and the film Field of Dreams. In the book and the film, Ray Kinsella feels inspired to plow under his corn in order to build a baseball field. In the text, he specifically makes an outfield because he believes that shoeless Joe Jackson will return. And so after months of playing under the corn and planting grass, Joe appears to Ray. And at the end of the first encounter, Joe asks, is this heaven? And Ray says, no, this is Iowa.